welcome everyone. Uh, happy pre-Nobel week. Um, I'm Lauren Wolf, the Deputy Editor, Editorial Director at CNN. Uh, the Nobels are like the Academy Awards and the Super Bowl for scientists. We at CNN love this time of year. Um, it's, it's, you know, for many reasons, one of which is that chemistry gets to take the center stage in the news coverage for a day. Um, all around the world. And the air right now is thick with anticipation. And today we're going to get to talk about some, some seriously impressive science. I've been getting up at 5 a.m. to uh, listen to the chemistry Nobel announcement for several years now, and I never get tired of it. What else I don't get tired of is talking with smart people like today's panelists for this webinar. Let me briefly introduce them to you. Uh, Carmen Draw, give a little wave, Carmen, is a freelance science journalist for outlets like Forbes and Princeton Alumni Weekly. She's also a recovering organic chemist and uh, a former member of CNN staff. Uh, Omar Farha, give a little wave, uh, is a seriously busy man. He's a professor of chemistry at Northwestern and adjunct professor at King Abdul. Aziz University, president of the firm Numat Technologies, and an editor with ACS Applied Materials and Interfaces. I'm not sure when you sleep. Um, okay, Marie, Marie Heffern uh, is a brand new professor at the University of California, Davis, where she's studying metals in medicine. And uh, she was also named one of CNN's talented 12 rising stars in chemistry this year by CNN. And finally, my co-host, Matt Davenport, who is pioneering how CNN does journalism by leading our brand new multimedia group. Matt's also a recovering physicist and a lover of Nobel data analysis. So um, here's how this here webinar is going to work. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the background of the Nobels and uh, the panelists and I are gonna discuss some truly deserving science before we get to the main event, which is our predictions. Um, after a couple questions, from me, the panelists will then be available to answer your questions in the audience. Uh, so send them in either through the webinar platform tools or if you're watching on YouTube, you can submit questions via the hashtag ChemNobel on Twitter. Uh, our lab assistants are gonna get those questions over to us. And we'll also be polling you throughout the webinar on various things, so no dozing off. Um, you never know when the panelists are gonna start arguing, so uh, you wanna be ready for that. <laughs> all right, moving on. <laughs> so very briefly, uh, to make sure we're all, we're all on the same page, um, I'm going to give you a very brief summary of the Nobel Prizes and how they're selected, or at least what we know about it, since it's a completely secretive process. Um, Alfred Nobel signed his last will in 1895, and you can see some of the wording of that here. His family opposed the will because it turned out that Alfred hadn't left them a whole lot. He had instead um, funneled this money into establishing the Nobel Prizes. And because of the fight that ensued over this, it took a couple of years before they actually started awarding prizes in 1901. Uh, in the will, Alfred stated that the prizes would be given to those who during the preceding year shall have conferred the greatest benefit to mankind. So over the years, we know that uh, this requirement has been interpreted a little bit more loosely by the Nobel Committee. Oftentimes, prizes don't get awarded um, the year after a big discovery is made, it, it can be decades until the, a science advance is actually honored. Um, some say that's to give time for the discovery's impact to be felt. Others just say that there's a long list of important science piling up and that there just aren't enough awards to go around. All right, moving on. Um, for the chemistry prize, uh, Nobel specified that it would be awarded by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Academy members select the winner or winners from a list of candidates that is supplied by the Nobel Committee for Chemistry. And you can see those folks here for this year. So starting last September, uh, just to give you a little timeline, these folks would have started sending um, invitations, about 3,000 of them, out to a select group of nominators. Uh, those nominators are members of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, members of the Nobel Committees uh, on Chemistry and Physics, past winners of the prizes, and certain chemistry professors across the globe. Uh, by this past summer, uh, the committee would have then sent their list of recommendations to the Academy. And as we speak, I think, uh, they, they say that they do this in October, which 
is almost right now, um, they will then be selecting the winners from that list by a majority vote. So they could be doing it right now. Um, unlike the Academy Awards though, uh, with the Nobel Prize, a short list of nominees is not available publicly. So what we're going to do today, which is predicting the winners, um, I'd say is even harder than uh, making Oscar predictions. So take that film critics. Moving on. Um, generally, the nominations that come in from that group of 3,000 invitees is kept secret for about 50 years. Um, if you want to know who was nominated for the Nobel Prize between 1901 and about 1966, uh, you can have a look at the nomination database uh, that's been released by the foundation, or uh, you can look at CNN's interactive database. We actually took that data uh, from their website and made, put it into a more compact, neat form where you can search it, and um, we've gleaned some things from it. Uh, moving on. One thing that we gleaned from our analysis of the database is that between 1901 and 1950, women chemists were nominated only 32 times out of a total of 1,987 nominations. And you can see that graphically represented here. Uh, two actually won during that time of all those nominations. Um, many scientists have, have bemoaned the dearth of women chemists on the Nobel list over the years. And in fact, uh, chemists discussed several specific women recently at the, this last ACS national meeting in the fall. Um, this, uh, they discussed women that were deserving and who should have won the Nobel. And that followed a, the year before there had been another Nobel symposium more generally about men and women who had been snubbed by the Nobel. So uh, moving on, this leads to our first question for the panelists. <clears throat> moving on. Um, so let's name a chemist who, if they aren't named a Nobel winner within the next five years, uh, will be considered officially snubbed. And we'll move on and start with Marie. Yeah, to answer this question, I picked Harry Gray. Uh, I was actually having a hard time thinking what I would give him a Nobel Prize for, aside from just being Harry Gray. I know there's um, some Lifetime Achievement Awards that have been talked about, but I think he's just contributed so much to not just bioinorganic chemistry, but inorganic chemistry and the way we understand coordination chemistry and electron transfer through biological systems, that I think it would be a shame if he did not get the Nobel Prize in the next five years. All right, let's move on then to Omar's pick. So obviously I picked, as you could see there, John Goodenough. And uh, we just heard that, you know, the award should be for the greatest benefit to mankind. And if iron, lithium ion battery is not, that's not one of what changed most of our lives, us, the panelists, everybody watching us, we all have iPhones, computers, even at one point in time, uh, Dreamliners were using uh, lithium ion batteries. If this is not a deserving of a Nobel award, something is wrong right there. All right, uh, let's then move on to Carmen's pick. I don't have much to add to what Omar so eloquently said. Uh, the laptop that I am using to get into this webinar to talk to everyone runs on a lithium ion battery. John Goodenough is in his 90s. Um, if that's not good enough for the Nobel Committee, pun intended, <laughs> I, do not, I don't know what is. Great. All right, I think we've we've seen some folks uh, in the uh, chat panel here also saying that they like good enough as a pick. But I'm gonna I'm gonna move on and uh, give give my pick as well. Um, this was inspired by the article that I was talking about earlier. Um, where we covered the symposium um, at the last ACS national meeting where a bunch of chemists talked about women who had been deserving of the Nobel Prize. And on that list was Darlene Hoffman. And uh, interestingly, Darlene is probably the only person on that list that could still win. Um, she's in her 90s. And uh, I'm giving a shout out here to Kit Chapman. That's the tweet that you see on the screen over at Chemistry World. He had this great series of tweets recently about how awesome Darlene Hoffman is. 
And my favorite um, of those was that once she was given a classified notebook, she did nuclear work, so a lot of it was classified. And um, the notebook required that you put three initials down and uh, she didn't have a middle initial. So she made one up and told people that her middle name was Santasia and gave herself the middle initial of X, which I just thought was super cool. Um, but aside from that, seriously, some of the, the science that she has done um, was impressive. So she was the first to show that a um, plutonium isotope could exist in nature. Uh, she found it in a rock formation that was billions of years old. And um, her team also sifted through debris from thermo thermonuclear tests. Um, and she isolated this fermium isotope that then helped her figure out some really important things about fission, uh, namely that the isotopes could split symmet symmetrically during the fission process. Um, Glenn Seaborg actually called that probably the most important discovery in the understanding of the fission process in the last quarter century when he was speaking in the 1990s. So anyway, I'm, I'm choosing her. She's awesome. Um, her science is awesome. And that's just to be clear, that is why I'm selecting her. But if you've ever read any stories from her, she's definitely battled some uh, discrimination against women. And it's just, it's also pretty inspiring. Um, all right, so I'm gonna move on now to Matt. Yeah, I didn't actually make a pick because I didn't want to, but uh, as Lauren <laughs> pointed out, um, it's been a while since uh, nuclear chemistry has been recognized by uh, the Nobel Committee. And that got, you know, we've been doing the state analysis on CMN for the Nobel Prize awardees. It got me thinking about like what the longest drought has been. Uh, we've seen some streaks broken this year in the sports world, right? You saw the Cubs win uh, the World Series, you saw the Cavs win. Well, that was a little bit ago, but it's it's an era of like droughts coming to an end. So I thought if, if, if there's a field that fits that criteria, which would it be? And it would be nuclear chemistry that hasn't won since 1960s with the caveat, I should let everyone watching know we assigned these designations, the, the award subfields you see, uh, using the uh, uh, Nobel Committee's designations whenever possible, but sometimes uh, they had like one-offs that we rolled into other places. But I still think with that in mind, nuclear chemistry is the, uh, the longest drought. Uh, and if you're out there wanting to root for an underdog, analytical chemistry is also <laughs> down there. Uh, so let's move, we've, we've heard uh, their picks for chem subs. We wanna know which, uh, we want to pull the audience and see which you guys agree with the most. So um, would it be John good enough for his work with lithium ion batteries, Harry Gray for pick your favorite contribution to chemistry, or Darlene Hoffman for contributions for nuclear chemistry. And so we have a poll right here. Just click whichever, um, I guess, hashtag chem snub. If they don't win by 2022, you think it'll be. And we will wrap this poll up in five, four, three, two, one. All right, let's see what the results were. Oh yeah, it's uh, good enough, got two thirds of the votes. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, Carmen, I'll kick this to you. Does that surprise you at all? No, I, not in the least. Uh, last year, I feel like we were all saying it's about time that good enough got the top prize. And here we are again. I, you know, maybe we'll be saying it again in 2018, but I, 90, 95 is he? That's that's up there. Time yeah, I think um, we uh, we talked about this earlier before the the webinar start officially started. But um, if he did win, uh, he would be the, the oldest person to win a Nobel Prize. So that would also be pretty exciting. Um, all right. Well, let's move on to our next question. The main event for our panelists here. Uh, who, we've talked about who should have win the Nobel Prize, but now let's talk about who will win it this year. What is your prediction? Let's start with Carmen. Move sure, on. so I am going with a little bit of polymer chemistry. Uh, I picked these folks last year and I think they're still strong contenders. Krzysztof Mariaszewski at uh, Carnegie Mellon, Ezio Rizzardo at Ciro, and David Solomon at the University of Melbourne. This is this is a prize that you can't argue is anything else but chemistry. This is about harnessing radicals to make polymers for things that 
people would recognize, everyday folks would recognize, this is, uh, this ticks all my boxes. You have cosmetics, L'Oreal, automotive coatings at places like Mitsubishi. And uh, these folks have also won some of the Bellwether prizes, like the Wolf Prize that um, are commonly won before someone gets the Nobel. All right, that's a good one. Let's uh, move on to Omar's pick. So for me, I actually had a hard time picking one. So I have uh, two choices here. And before I say that, if you look at the choices I'm putting here, it's actually both are awesome examples of what uh, they are both immigrants that came to this country, uh, got educated in this country. They did all the science that we're going to be talking about in this country and not if when they will win the Nobel, it will be for this country. And that's something this country, again, should take these things seriously when we're talking about immigration, immigrants taking other people's jobs, or uh, we'll leave it at that point. So the first one, you know, John, good enough, and we talked earlier about, but let me add, beside, you know, the lithium ion batteries, is he also had something to do with the rules to determine the signs for the magnetic super exchange that a lot of us maybe we don't even know about that. Uh, additionally, at the age of 95, he was just published a paper uh, that changed even what's the electrolyte uh, to stop the dendritic issues that uh, liquid electrolyte causing the flammability of lithium ion batteries, which is that's the next generation a battery that most likely it will be used for the next 20, 30 years uh, at the age of 95. So if he's not deserving of this award, again, I am not sure what other person is. The second choice is Omar Yagi. Again, he is a Jordanian American chemist, came to this country at very young age, uh, worked his behind off, uh, to get to where he is right now. He is a, a, a chaired professor at the University of UC Brooklyn. Uh, you know, he's known for, you know, establishing the work on the design synthesis of programmable materials with super high surface area. Uh, it's not just for the application or what these materials can be used for, but also for all the basic science that he did to establish a field that many of us right now uh, in that field. And just by the way, you know, if people, which I don't think that's a requirement for something to be commercialized to win the Nobel, uh, but if that's a requirement here, these materials has been commercialized in the last uh, few months. So if that's uh, a requirement, then there is a check right there. Uh, and I will leave it at that. Well, I think we'll be talking about that commercialization question a little bit later. So thanks, Omar. Now let's move on to Marie's pick. Um, so I had a hard time thinking about who I will predict to win the Nobel Prize versus who I want to win the Nobel Prize. So I settled on someone who fits both criteria for me. And I think, uh, you know, that we show that chart with the graph of um, all the different fields and what's not listed on there is chemical biology. And I think the field of chemical biology is deserving of a Nobel Prize at some point. Having to pinpoint one person is tough, but I think what I, that many of us can agree with is that Carolyn Bertozzi has really changed the field of chemical biology and being able to provide um, a new strategy, I think, to actually use chemistry to study these biological systems. And even if her work started with sugars, people have taken that strategy so many different directions um, just to study other types of systems. So that is, uh, and on top of that, uh, she's a woman. And I think, you know, based on the stats that you showed, Lauren, I, it's about time for a woman to win another Nobel. That would be awesome. Thank you, Marie. All right, we'll move on now to my pick, um, or picks, shall I say. Uh, like Omar, I couldn't uh, pick just one thing. So, and, uh, you know, I, I figured other people would do plenty of talking about good enough. So 
I've made this choice in past years and I haven't won yet, um, but you know, I still firmly believe it's a good pick and I've included here two other, two other people who I think if lithium ion batteries win would, would possibly get it with good enough. I think Whittingham um, was the first one to make a um, electrode that stored lithium ions and then good enough improved on that. And then Akira Yoshino put that together with the carbon electrode um, or the, yeah, the, the other carbon anode in the first working lithium ion battery. Um, but just so that we had more things to talk about and more options, I made a second pick. So let's move on to that one. Um, so uh, uh, my second choice is the gentleman who discovered chaperone proteins. And um, I saw this slide earlier and thought, wow, those are some awesome like dual mustaches and very serious looks there. Um, but uh, in all seriousness, um, you know, these macromolecules, these chaperones um, are responsible for helping proteins fold in cells. They're sort of like a micromanager for the proteins in cells. And uh, the first one that this pair actually found was the heat shock protein 60. Um, and then later Horwich um, also solved the crystal structure of heat protein or heat shock protein 60s um, bacterial equivalent, which is called Grow EL. Um, this, it's just a major discovery that still hasn't been honored. And given everything that we know now about neurodegenerative diseases and things like that, I think, um, I think it's not a question of, you know, will this win? It's just when will it win? Um, and what I will say is I, I will admit stealing this idea from my, uh, my, my coworker, Sarah Everts, uh, who's a CNN reporter and wrote a, wrote a cover story earlier uh, this year about protein folding. She went to a, a Nobel sponsored um, symposium and uh, it was about protein folding. And she has this great anecdote in the story about um, how uh, you know there have been these symposia before, and maybe five years later, some of the speakers at these meetings have sometimes won Nobel prizes. And uh, these two gentlemen spoke at the symposium this summer. So we shall see what happens. It's like insider uh, information, right there. <laughs> uh, I know it felt like yeah. insider scoop. So, um, if they give Nobel prizes for mustaches, this is a must. <laughs> I know they're amazing. All right. Well, let's move on to uh, Matt. Matt, what's your pick? So I am I am picking CRISPR Cas9 uh, this year uh, for a number of bad reasons, honestly. Uh, a good one too, but I'll start with the bad ones. <laughs> one is I could copy and paste the slide from last year, which was very nice. Uh, secondly, um, we covered it a lot recently, uh, so that will make it easier for me on Wednesday. When we have to put together a video about this, whatever wins. Um, so that would be awesome if uh, the Nobel Committee is looking to do me any favors. Um, but I, the, the real reason, right, um, it's just like this is such a transformative technology, right? Uh, and I think everyone recognizes that now. And I think that there's been a lot of emphasis on what it means for, uh, maybe not even emphasis, but focus on in, in media, like what it means for people and medicine, things like that. But uh, the, the impacts beyond that, right? Uh, we saw in an uh, article earlier this year by Melly Baumgartner, right, that Dow is already using this to use CRISPR in agricultural products uh, that they plan to commercialize soon. And so it's not just gonna transform medicine or biology, well, I guess this all funders, fun, falls under the umbrella of biology, but it's not just medicine, and, you know, humans. It's like, it's, it, it's going to, it could change the fabric of society, right? And that's a, I feel like that's Nobel worthy. Um, so you've heard our picks, uh, audience. We want to know who you agree with. Will it be pioneering work in polymers, uh, good enough uh, for lithium ion batteries, or will the award go to metal organic frameworks? Uh, will it be for bioorthogonal chemistry? Will it go to chaperone proteins, or will it be CRISPR Cas9? Uh, and we'll go to the poll now. Please cast your votes. Uh, just click the button next to whichever pick you agree with most, and we'll close this down in five, four, three, two, one. What have we got? Uh, we got about half going for uh, uh, 
lithium ion batteries or metal organic frameworks. Um, so we actually had a question come in. We will be getting to as many questions as we can at the end of this webinar too, with a Q and A with the audience. But there was a really good one I thought that came in from both Twitter and the chat window for Omar, which was, would you nominate anyone else for metal organic frameworks? You know, I, when I mentioned, uh, you know, John good enough, I didn't mean he would be the only one winning, you know, the good news, up to three people can be shared the same thing with the metal organic framework so if i am sitting there you know definitely i could see susumu kuragawa from japan uh, you know could be even uh, richard Robson from australia so i uh, but i have you know i picked uh omar because i think uh, his contribution to the field unmatched all right well, thank you everyone for your picks and thanks to the audience for voting. We're going to move on to one last question for the panelists. So, uh, many chemists were pleasantly surprised uh, last year when molecular machines claimed the Chem Nobel. Um, in fact, Stu Cantrill of Nature Chemistry was a panelist at this very event last year. And uh, he mentioned molecular machines during our discussion. And he said, you know, it's just such cool chemistry. I have to say it, but I don't think it'll win because it doesn't, you know, have a killer app yet, right? Everybody has made these machines, but we don't know what we're going to do with them just yet. So our question to the panelists is, what's the next area of chemistry that might distinction winning for its merits as a chemical discovery and furthering fundamental science? So let's move on and start with Marie. So uh, I picked DNA nanostructures and this is actually a really tough question because a lot of things I was thinking about either actually already has a killer app or already won the Nobel Prize. Uh, but I remember learning about DNA nanostructures when you take this, you know, this Watson Crick base pair standard biochemistry and starting to see that people could make pretty cool structures with it. And they would have interesting properties just with the degree of hydrogen bonding. And, you know, I think one of the challenges for getting it into a killer app partially is the yield, just getting enough of it. So these are, what I'm referring to DNA nanostructures is not necessarily DNA containing nanostructures, but these are structures formed um, just completely by DNA and taking advantage of the specificity and the binding properties to form nanotubes or what they call DNA origami like you see here. And I think it was, I remember seeing this picture as being described as a cool molecular trick. But, but when you think about, you know, as a, as a fundamental discovery that you can not only observe this natural biochemistry, but take advantage of it to make new structures, then it's a pretty, a pretty neat chemical discovery, I think. All right, I agree. Um, so let's move on then to, I think Omar is next. Uh, so actually I put names, uh, maybe I misunderstood the question. So I, beside, uh, you know, work in bio inorganic chemistry, and I picked those three names, which I'm sure they've been picked before. And as Marie said earlier, for all three, it's very hard to say one specific thing. They all accomplish so much that we, the next generation, get a build on what we learn from them for the next uh, 50 years, 100 years. So I would say for Harry Gray, the electron transfer uh, in proteins. Uh, for Professor Holm, you know, the synthesis of analogs that we see uh, in proteins. Metals in biology uh, for uh, Professor Lippert. I mean, you, I could spend here the next half an hour, which we shouldn't, talking about what those guys accomplish and how we will be building careers, us, the newer generation, on what those guys discovered. All right. And finally, well, not finally, but let's move on to Carmen. <laughs> sure. Uh, so I chose origin of life research, kind of writ large. Um, you know, it's hard to think of anything more fundamental than figuring out, you know, what is the point at which inanimate chemistry became animate life. That is a fundamental chemistry question. That is something that people who are communicators of chemistry who talk about, well, we need to show the general public the wonder 
that is chemistry, you know, physics as the big bang, biology as evolution, chemistry has this. And, you know, when you think about people like Craig Venter or George Church, or even heck, a, a second Nobel for Jack Shostak, the kind of people that work on minimal cells, just how can you strip life down to its most basic essence? Those kinds of things might get the Nobel committee interested. I would argue that origin of life has kind of won before back in 89 when Tom Check and Sidney Altman won for the discovery of catalytic RNA. And I actually went back and looked at the press release from that year, 1989, and there are no applications talked about on the press release at all. They just have one sentence, catalytic RNA will probably provide gene technology with a new tool, period. So, you know, there's, there's precedent there. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it sounds like a strong case. And I think moving on, we may have one other slide for Carmen. Ah, uh, yes, that was okay. the, uh, yeah, that was the 89. Yeah, plus a, a shout out to you. All right, well, let's move on. I, I had a similar thought um, in terms of, you know, setting a, a precedent, but, um, you know, I was thinking about molecular machines and what another equivalent of that, you know, I could watch the like animations of these molecular machines spin around all day long and they're so cool. And I, you know, the, the work that goes into making them is so cool. And I, I think that a lot about nanomotors where, you know, we see these things, these, um, they're, they're all kinds of different ones, you know, the ones with, um, I think it's uh, zinc on the inside and they react with hydro peroxide and produce oxygen bubbles and they zoom around. I could watch, you know, videos of that all day long too. Um, and I think that there is a defined app that people would like to use them for, which is, you know, delivering drugs in the body in a controlled way, kind of fantastic voyage. Um, that old movie from the sixties uh, has inspired that, but, I think we're very, very, very far from ever making that happen. And, you know, some people think it might never happen. Um, but I, I think if someone did make it happen, then that would definitely be uh, prize worthy. Matt actually has written stories about nanomotors. So um, I'm going to ask him, you know, if, if this were to win, you know, who, who do you think would be on the list of uh, winners? Um. Just based on yeah volume of what we covered right, uh, Joe Wang at uh, UC San Diego like he's I think I feel like his hand is in every paper that comes across our desk when we're looking at nanometers, which is not to for the record that's not true. That was like a figure of speech. Just want to make that clear. Uh, and so that's the first thing that comes to mind. But I think there's there's uh, you know there's a lot of interesting work going on in that article like um, uh, using. Uh, nanomotors maybe in ways that people haven't thought before for like uh clean waste streams and like the question is is that work considered nobel worthy i think that's something we might actually see come to pass right because it's probably easier for uh companies for example to work that into waste streams that aren't supposed to be released into the environment or to people before actually seeing these things in people but we also saw work in uh i want to say petri dishes i could be wrong check out my story uh where people threaded uh, the tail of sperm cells through a magnetic motor, right? And then pilot it to an egg. And so, you know, there's there's that application where it's biological, but outside the body, and maybe there's different rules for that. And so one of the, one of the big hurdles, I think, for the application that you described, right, is like there are regulatory agencies that are gonna have to take a long, hard look at these things, and that could slow down their, their application. Uh, and so we might see some applications that kind of flirt with that but aren't quite that and i'm not sure what the threshold would be when you say all right this is who we, this is when we give the nobel and this is to who we give it this is who we give it to if that makes sense yeah all right well let's uh move on to your pick then matt yeah so the luxury of uh being the one that puts these slides together is i get to promote my own work and also <laughs> see all of your picks and then go from there um <laughs> But mine is a, it's, it's, it's sort of a wacky pick and I acknowledge that because this carbine, this 1D allotrope of carbon is so contentious that even if people made it, like I don't think every, you could it'd be just as hard to get everyone to agree that it was what you said it was, right? And like that by quasi -crystals, itself. Quasi-crystals, quasi-crystals. <laughs> um, so, but so, and I, 
so this I think is inspired by my background. As Laura mentioned at the top, I, I am in physics, and I think you see this sort of thing happen in physics where people are like, oh, if they discover if they discover gravity waves, that's going to win. If they discover the Higgs boson, that's going to win. It's just like to me, it's become one of those things that like if they can find it, like I don't even care what it does, right? Like like it's just <laughs> this big scientific deal. Uh, and so I took a different approach to the question where it's not even a thing yet, uh, at least widely accepted thing. But if it were, I think I think a lot of people would be excited. Uh, and so now we're going to toss it to the audience. Do you, we want to know which of us you agree with the most? Would you would you pick DNA nanostructures, uh, bioinorganic pioneering, origin of life research, uh, nanomotors, or carbine? So go ahead and uh, vote now. Uh, select again just the button right next to the choice of your choosing, <laughs> and we will shut this down in five, four, three, two, one. All right, we got Orange Life Research. Uh, so even though okay. Carmen won, I'm going to uh, kick it to Marie because she had my favorite pick and I can do that as a co-host. <laughs> um, I guess, so not to put you on the spot, but how long do you think it might be before, like you said, it, like there's just so much potential there and not saying that what's been done isn't tapping that potential, but when do you see like the biggest step coming is like, is that, five, 10 years are like further down the road. Are you talking, you're talking to me, right? Oh. Yes. You're asking me to predict how long chemistry <laughs> will take to get to yes. You know, I would say probably in the 10 year range, we'll have a good application. I think the question is whether you would define that as a killer app, but I think we're, you know, we're making a lot of headway just in terms of how we do chemistry and how we produce these things and with chemical biology just rising and even something like CRISPR, I'm sure, <laughs> can probably affect the way that we can make these things. Um, yeah, I would say maybe less than 10 years, we can have, have a good a good killer app for this. Whether or not it'll get the Nobel Prize might depend on what that application would be. Um, I think it's also going to depend on what kind of properties. So I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done to actually look at the mechanical properties of these things. And, um, you know, I think if there's unprecedented numbers for thing X, um, then that would speed it up quite a bit. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, again, sorry for putting you on the spot, but that was, that was a great answer. Um, we're actually going to open it up to Q&A from the audience uh, real quick, but before we do that, I want to promote uh, CNN's uh, excellent, if I may say so myself, uh, Chem Nobel coverage. We've already got some lead-up coverage. Stu Borman wrote this uh, fantastic article about women overlooked for Nobel honors. Uh, there's even a quiz to go along with it, so please visit that link below after the webinar and uh, you know, test your knowledge there. Um, we uh, Just as a way of reminder, the day of the Nobel, October 4th, uh, we'll have, we'll be your one-stop shop for all of your chemistry Nobel news. We'll have a story online the morning of, we'll have a video up later in the day that you can share with all your friends. So uh, yeah, be sure to bookmark us now. Uh, and so this is, Lauren, I'm actually gonna open up with you because we have several questions about, that sort of get to the inner workings of the Nobel committee. Um, and so I, I, like we've talked about this and I, I feel like you are more versed in it than I. I'm still going to ask these questions, but I think the it's important to say that I don't think we actually know how they make a lot of the decisions they make. Um, and so from here on out, we're conjecturing, and which I'm totally cool with, and it's going to be fun. But can you can you tell us like just an, a brief about what we do know about the process? <laughs> Not a lot. Um, I I would invite any of the panelists to to chime in here. Um, I mean, it seems like they collect these nominations, as far as I can tell. I mean, some some people say things like, "Oh, well, it's been a couple of years since so like such and such field won. It's it's time it's time for that." But I've seen interviews with people who were former members of the committee, and they say they've said it doesn't work like that at all. Um, but then again, you know, it feels a little bit like Fight Club. They don't talk about Fight Club, so <laughs> it could have, it could work like that, and we we still wouldn't know. They they just aren't telling us. Um, I don't know. Just uh, I'll kick it over to the other panelists. Does anybody else have any insight into this? Have you spoken to anyone who's ever gotten one of these invites? Well, I so I tried to get into the minds of the Nobel Committee for my predictions. 
And so I try to analyze who has won it and see if there's a pattern. And the long, I guess the short answer of that is there doesn't seem to be one. <laughs> um, and so I wonder if it's one of those patterns where, you know, let's say it's not necessarily a regular pattern. <laughs> um, I So this kind of goes to, um, Matt, your pick was CRISPR. And I think that it's, CRISPR is definitely going to win, but I think if, when I talk to other people about whether or not CRISPR will win, one of the, the biggest questions is all of this political controversy, right? So I think at the very least, maybe that, that comes into play as to whether it's clear if a Nobel, someone should win the Nobel or if there's still some controversy that would cause an uproar. <laughs> I've wondered, you know, I'll just chime in here and say, I've wondered that too. I've heard people say, oh, well, it won't win, CRISPR won't win until they've sorted out this, the patent controversy. And I thought, well, but at the same time, these three people that, you know, everyone keeps talking about and who are fighting over the patents, those three people aren't going to change. So technically they could give the prize to them any time. However, I would guess that probably that ceremony might be a little bit, um, <laughs> shall, we say, shall we say, so that could be another reason for, for waiting a little while before they do it. So uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, now we're, we're going into this conjecture territory. Uh, and so I'll kick this first question to Omar, which is why hasn't good enough won yet? What was, why hasn't he won already, I guess? I, I don't know. I mean, uh, it, it, I, you could think of too many reasons. The question is, I'm not going to even go why he didn't win yet, because he's going to win this year. Uh, and, I, <laughs> I, and I am a believer it's better to be late than never. Uh, so, and I will leave it at that. Does uh, Maria Carmen anything to add there? Any, any speculation? Well, this goes back to how we don't entirely know how the Nobel Committee chooses the winner, right? I, I, you know, one of the things I used to think was, oh, when they're old enough, they'll get it. But uh, obviously that hasn't, I mean, the youngest Nobel Prize winner was like in his 20s or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't know. It, it's sort of, we were talking about looking for patterns. Has anybody and I don't know how long back you can look at an archive of the makeup of the committee. Can you gauge what fields were awarded based on the percentages or the representation of various fields in the Nobel Committee during that era? That would be some interesting numbers to crunch. Oh, Matt Davenport. Yeah. Nobel um, data analysis. We were turning already. Get on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Matt, um, and, uh, I wanted to po poke in a little bit about nanomotors. You know, we talked a lot about, you know, fantastic voyage drug delivery, but nobody's talked about Bob Langer. And I don't know whether that's a, that's a medicine Nobel. Is that a chemistry Nobel? It's not fantastic voyage, but it sure as heck is drug delivery that yeah. is, you know, 20 some odd startups worth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it seems to me that that might be more in the medicine. And that's like one of the things that I was struggling with is what goes into medicine versus chemistry versus physics. Um, I don't know. So the other yeah. two awards, they take some from the chemistry, but not the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and we kind of touched on this question a little bit earlier with there being sort of a political aspect, the CRISPR pick. Um, some folks on the internet have asked if we might see the same thing with with good enough with you know there's the recent publication that omar you mentioned which has kind of gotten a mixed reaction do things and i, I don't want to focus just on that but like brought it up to include the you know the patent dispute around crispr how heavily do you think the nobel committee considers these sorts of things like in my head i like to imagine them as sort of in their bubble and those things don't matter but who knows how true that is uh carmen do you have any how, how do you see it Hmm. Come back to me. <laughs> uh, I mean, for uh, good enough. I mean, he would win it for his, you know, contribution, original contribution to the lithium ion battery, because this field is so huge and many people are working there that the initial discoveries, that's what he would win on is not his paper in 2017. So in that case, I would I would think it would be really ridiculous 
for the Nobel Committee uh, to say, oh, let's wait for another couple of years. I'm sorry. I, I hope he would win, uh, would live for another hundred years. I really do hope because he's a brilliant he a Nobel man. for that. <laughs> exactly. He, he's a brilliant man. But at the end of the day, he's 95 and he made something and developed something deserving of this award. So I don't know how long longer can we wait. And that's, you know, that's the unfortunate thing, right? We've seen a lot of times where the window yeah. just closes, right? Yeah, absolutely. I hope not this one. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, we talked a little bit about this uh, in the warm up, uh, but we had this interesting question come our way, right? Where we talked early on in the, in the webinar about Nobel snubs, people who have not won before that we feel are due for an award. Uh, what about people that are due for a second award? Um, I guess I'm trying to be diplomatic about this. I think, Marie, I think we're back to you. I mean, I've got my circlet, circlet permutations correct. Well, I feel like I'm cheating because we already talked about this in the warm up. <laughs> but, you know, we had mentioned click chemistry um, and Sharpless winning again. So I'm, I'm actually going to toss that. I think, Carmen, you're the one who said that first. <laughs> um, I yeah, think I feel like so. I'm no, oh, yeah. I, no, yeah, somebody else did. Yeah. Okay, I feel like I'm taking someone else's answer, but I completely agree. It's okay. With that. We all uh, we all ended up agreeing that yeah. the history is deserving of another award. So yes, there you go. The question is there is so many good things out there that they are deserving of awards. Uh, then do you give a second one or do you give a, a first chance to many others who have not won it? Well, and I yeah. think that's a hard decision here and most likely the committee members they get to go for let's give it to somebody like good enough uh, who hasn't won one yet before we give it to somebody who already did yeah uh, it's, it's interesting there's uh, uh there's a paper in uh, nature chemistry that uh, historian jeff seaman put out about some of this 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 dual nobel but in the specifically the synthesis and he's talking about woodward corey you know, had Woodward lived, could he have won again for all the, um, the, the Woodward Hoffman rules, those sorts of things. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a fair point. You have so many areas of chemistry, Matt's crunching the numbers, finding that nuclear chemistries had a huge drought, good enough is 95, something's got to give. Yeah, and I think it's kind of, you know, there is, for example, we take something like clip, clip chemistry, right? It would require one person to get a second, but then if you don't get it, then there are other people who are part of that discovery who could be getting snubbed as well. So I think it's an interesting question, right? Is this, if you avoid the dual Nobel, does that mean that other deserving scientists end up not getting the Nobel for their discoveries? Which means, uh, you know, then don't give chemis uh, chemistry Nobels to uh, medicine <laughs> and uh, open one for biologists. Uh, this way, we'll have uh, more chances for chemists. I think uh, I think we all agreed uh, during the practice that we would start up a Kickstarter for to establish a Nobel Prize in Biology. Um, that way, uh, we yes. can get some more chemistry prizes and even things out. Uh, so, anybody you know in the comments, if you'd like to contribute to that, let us know. Um, but, uh, anyway, back to you, Matt. Any other questions? Yeah, there's, there's two I want to try to get in, but I know we're coming down to the wire, so I apologize. Uh, if we didn't get to your question. These were fantastic coming in from the audience in the, in the chat window from the webinar and on Twitter. Uh, but uh, we sort of touched on this just now, right? Like there are constraints to the Nobel Prize, and for good reason. But one of the thing, one of the consequences of that constraint is that you're going to leave somebody out. You're going to, you know, someone's going to, you know, effectively die before they they get an award that they were deserving of. Um, if you could lift the constraint of it just going to three people and give it to just a sub-genre of chemistry, uh, what would be your pick for 2017? And we'll start with Omar. Uh, Why well, you started with me. Uh, <clears throat> sure, I, I'm going to uh, stick with uh, the same picks. Uh, Lithium-ion battery, and you could do a whole genre if you want. Or... Uh, <laughs> Uh, metal organic frameworks and again do a whole field. Oh, I definitely 
guess I'll go. Um, it, I sort of mentioned this already with Bertozzi, but I think chemical biology is just an, it's like a new field of chemistry and all these different um, departments are starting to include it and make new classes for it. So I, I just think, you know, someone needs to win it there, but if it doesn't have, if it can't go to a particular person, just the whole field. <laughs> I have to second what Marie says and you know depending on where the chemical biology goes they could even encroach on the medicine prize take that <laughs> I love that um I guess I will I will also answer what about neuroscience um chemical neuroscience I think there was a comment that came in people asking about whether Diceroth and Boyden should win for optogenetics I think I think that if that does win which it probably would I uh, to me, that's kind of like the equivalent of CRISPR for, for certain things. People are using that in the lab and changing the way we're doing science. Um, but at this point, I think it would be a medicine prize. Even though there are chemical elements to it, it kind of straddles both both worlds. So maybe we just create them a separate prize also. And so we have another Kickstarter? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. And that's a, that's a brilliant segue to the, the last question. Of, I feel like we might have time for one more, but we've gotten some great picks from our audience too, and I'm going to leave some great ones out. But I wanted to like include some of these that we've seen coming in on the window and just uh, give you guys a choice of three and see uh, which, oh gosh, I just closed the document. There we go. Which you would pick of the three. Uh, I don't want to say dark horse, but like a pick outside of your own. Uh, dye sensitized solar cells. Optogenetics, and then uh, direct CH functionalization. Carmen. Oh, oh, that's tough. Um, boy, CH functionalization. There's there's been so much activity. There's a whole NSF center. There's a whole lot. Um, I I love the idea. I don't, I want to wait a couple years on it. Um, that's that's kind of my that's kind of my thinking. Um. So I actually almost said optogenetics uh, before, for one of my answers to the questions. Uh, so I would, I'll pick that. Um, I just wasn't sure if it goes to medicine or chemistry. And, um, but you know, since, since that's one of the choices, I'll, I'll support that. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead, Omar. Yeah, so uh, since uh, I would go for CH functionalization because uh, there is a lot to be done there uh, give you an example if one day we'll be able to uh, take uh, methane to methanol or, uh, or uh, to longer alkanes or uh, what the pharma industry is based on a lot of CH activation so in that, that case yeah I think that would be what I would go for. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Did you, did you have a pick, Lauren? Did I just miss it while I was? Well, I was I was going to say what what about solar cells? I think somebody in the chat window asked about Michael Gretzel. Um, you know, I, I sort of see that as like a batteries thing, but it, they haven't actually come to the same level as batteries in terms of their usage. But you know, at some point, um, whenever they they figure some of this out, you know, who knows? Maybe we wait for perovskites to come to some sort of fruition before that would get the prize i don't know um but it, it feels like at some point that has to get a prize as well great now the last question we, we touched on already so i'll start with you lauren we had one member of the audience i think may have tuned in later missed it but if you could pick uh a female nobel laureate this year who would it be and i know you've already done that uh lauren so i'll pick you first so you can go back to it and give our other panelists a little bit of time to think yeah, yeah. So um, for that for that person, I did say earlier, Darlene Hoffman. She was on on this list of of women overlooked for the Nobels that we had published um, a little while ago, and she's just done some really important nuclear chemistry. Uh, you know, Glenn Seaborg himself said that one of the things that she discovered was um, one of the most important things in the past quarter century um, in terms of learning about fission processes. And I just I think she's pretty, pretty big rock star. So she was, she was my pick. We'll go to Marie next because you also. Okay. Well, so I did pick Carolyn Bertozzi, but just so I can give another answer, I think I would also pick Joanne Stubby. That's just going back to my bioinorganic roots. I think she is so deserving of recognition. Um, just you know, she's especially in 
the field that she was in just being a pioneer. Um, and as a, a woman, I mean, she really is many of our heroes as well, so. All right, Carmen, have you, have you had enough time to? Yeah, I, I agree with all the no nominations, I guess, so far. Um, what about what about Madeline Julier? I mean, you want to talk about a pioneer of organic chemistry. She may have been the first uh, woman, maybe at an American university, to be appointed. And she has an impressive, impressive body of work. Which brings us to Omar. I got to go with uh, Marie's first choice, uh, Pertosi. Um, Not much I, to add beside what Marie said. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, we are we are running out of time, uh, and so I want to take this opportunity to thank our panelists for joining us for this awesome discussion. Uh, a huge thanks to our audience, everyone that tuned in on the webinar on YouTube, was contributing on Twitter. This was a ton of fun for us, and we're glad you showed up and. Uh, ask such great questions. Uh, before we sign off, though, I want to ask you guys, do you have any concluding thoughts as we head into Nobel Week? Uh, I guess I'm going to go left right on my screen, so that's that's Omar. Uh, let me start by actually uh, thanking Lauren for inviting me to be uh, among those wonderful panelists and also thank the attendees for uh, spending the last 50 minutes with us. So thank you guys for the wonderful questions. So I guess we're going right to left. <laughs> um, I, I just want to thank you know thank you guys for the opportunity to be a panelist. This is also just a really fun thing to get to think about all the amazing science, like both inside and outside our field. So it's it's a ton of fun. I think this is a great time for us chemists um, to just really celebrate the kind of science we've done here. Yeah. I'll uh, third, I guess, what Omar and Marie said. It's always a pleasure to be part of this and to get to meet the other super smart panelists that you folks bring <laughs> on. Um, I, I hope, and again, this is the day that chemistry gets in the spotlight. And I hope that whoever wins will use that bully pulpit for a cause and not, you know, necessarily just chemistry, but something that they feel passionate about. It humanizes scientists, and that's something that we need now more than ever. All right. Uh, that was a really good good last thought to end on. And I'll, I'll thank all three of you and Matt. Um, you know, we, we wouldn't have these webinars if it wasn't for our panelists, and you guys make it what it is, and we just appreciate you taking your time. The other thought that I uh, was left with after this webinar is that if good enough doesn't win, I'm worried what Omar is going to do. <laughs> yeah, we're going oh, no, no, no. to uh, have a Kickstarter for a project. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's winning this year. <laughs> All right. Well, we will see everyone in the audience. Stay tuned next week. You'll get the news from CNN. And Omar, if he does win, I'm going to send you. Uh, um, a, a special prize of your own. I have two choices, so either one, I will get something. <laughs> okay, all right, good. <laughs> <laughs>All right, so thank you everyone for joining us. And we would love to hear your thoughts about today's broadcast. Um, you can reach out to us through all the things you've been doing for the program, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or by email at acswebinars at acs.org. And just a reminder that our weekly broadcasts are just one of the many, many benefits that ACS has to offer, including access to the expertly written CNEN news articles, support for furthering your career, and our very own ACS webinars archive. So to find out more information about those benefits, please visit bit.ly slash benefits ACS. We are curious to hear what you thought of today's broadcast, and so a few brief questions will pop up as you exit the webinar. And that wraps us up for today. So on behalf of all of us here at the ACS Webinar Studio in Washington, DC, thank you all so much for joining us. And we will see you next week or tomorrow if you decide to tune in.